I like you people. <laughs> All right, final session. How to stay married and not kill your spouse. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a look at uh, what it takes to do that. But uh, before we do, I want to take you to heaven and put you on a committee. And uh, we're going to go back 4,000 years in time to the time of King David. Now, King David had five wives. Why any man would do that to himself is beyond understanding. (laughs) But he had five of them. And now we need to decide on our committee which one of these women is going to be the mother of the next king of Israel. He's going to be King Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. This was during Solomon, or this was during Israel's golden age. It was the best time Israel ever had it. It was glorious. They, you talk about a run on the stock market. I mean, prosperity, no wars. It was fantastic because this king was so incredible. Who is going to be the mama of this king and then become the great, great, great grandmother of the Lord Jesus Christ himself? Kind of an important decision, right? Now, ladies, you would think wife number one, right? She should have dibs. She was there first. But we know it wasn't her because uh, David got mad at her and quit having sex with her, which is easy to do if you have four more in the wings. (laughs) And you probably want to discount wife number five. You remember her, Bathsheba? The only reason she's there is because of lust, lying, adultery, and murder. King David saw her taking a bath. See, that's what lust will do to you. Saw her taking a bath, seduced her, had sex with her, got her pregnant, and then murdered her husband to hide the whole thing and married her. There's nothing holy about this. There's nothing right about this. God never intended for that woman to be in the house. All right, so how would you decide? You think about that, and we'll come back to that. Okay, how to stay married and not kill anybody. Step number one, you've got to avoid bitterness and resentment. Now, bitterness and resentment can build when one person feels they are unfairly bearing the burden of the relationship. When the weight of the relationship falls more on their shoulder than the other one's shoulder, then they will start to feel very bitter and resentful towards their spouse. Now, how men and women uh, keep score is very different from each other to determine who's carrying the most amount of weight. Now, what I'm about to share with you, uh, you know, people ask me a lot, you know, where did you learn all this stuff? What are your different influences? And, you know, 32 years of marriage, that's one influence. (laughs) You know? But a lot of different people and listening to stuff and I hear ideas and I take them and change them and stuff. This particular, one of the guys that had probably a huge impact in my life uh, about relationships was, was John Gray. And I think the guy's absolutely brilliant. I'm a lot funnier than he is, but he's brilliant, all right? And, uh, and this section is, is, this is gray to the T, okay? I just admit it right up front. But the reason I share this is because his insights on how men and women keep score is absolutely brilliant. It truly is. You see, men, when it comes to us keeping score, we're quick to give ourselves huge bonus points for everything we do. <laughs> you know, we crawl out of bed when we'd rather stay in, and just for that, we give ourselves 500 points. And then we go to work and we put up with all the stuff at work and we earn the paycheck and we give ourselves, you know, 2,000 points for that. And we come home without chasing other women and we give ourselves huge points for that, you know. So, so we walk in the door, it's like 4,500, you know. And that's why a lot of men have no problem sitting on the couch and now contributing nothing. Because in his mind, he's way up in points for the day and now he's given you a chance to catch up. Now, I didn't say it was right. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. I'm just saying this is the way his brain ticks. And a lot of guys will actually start feeling very bitter towards their wives if they feel their wives are trying to make them do stuff. Because in his male psyche, he's way up in points for the day. He shouldn't have to do anything else. Now, the problem here is that women keep score a little differently. Let me show you how a woman would score the same man's day. He gets out of bed when he'd rather stay in. And for that, she loves and appreciates him and gives him, ding, one point. (laughs) And then he goes to work and he earns a big paycheck and does all this stuff. And she goes, "Ah, I love that. And she goes, ding, one point. And then he comes home without chasing other women and, and comes home. And she's so glad to see him. Ding, one point. So you walk in, you got three. 
Oh, she also got up. She also went to work. She also cleaned the toilet. She also took the kids to piano lessons. She also had it in. It was 13 to 3. <laughs> and you don't want to do anything? And now she starts screaming at her husband, which in a way is a good thing because it's the silent ones who really too kill, do kill people. <laughs> <laughs> If it gets quieter on your house, I'd get nervous if I were you. <laughs> so, um, she, she, she starts getting very, very angry. Now, when guys first hear about this, they get very discouraged. They go, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that no matter what I do, I get one lousy stinking point? Well, the answer is yes. <laughs> but the good news is you can make this work for you. Because what men fail to realize is that women respond to virtually any simple act of kindness and reward it the same way as they would a big act of kindness. Right? Now, guys don't understand this. They think it's got to be big. It's got to be special. Girls, you have to understand, the reason why we don't do a lot of small things around the house is because to a man, it doesn't mean anything. It's not that we hate you. We just couldn't possibly care less. It means nothing, and because it means nothing to us, we think it should mean nothing to you. But guys, you can't make that mistake. She scores very differently from you. Simple acts of kindness. It's, it's those simple, like, like I told you last night, it's those simple acts of kindness that got her to fall in love with you in the first place. It's relatively easy to get a woman to fall in love with you if she'll pay attention to you in the first place. That's the hard part. <laughs> you cross that hurdle, you got it made. As long as you Pay attention. Simple acts of kindness. Simple. You do that, you can keep a woman crazy in love with you for your entire life. Simple acts of kindness. Every time you do a simple act of kindness. Ding! 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 But guys, we don't think that way. If It's, it's got to be big. It's got to be important. That's why a lot of guys, they'll only go all out for their wives, you know, about four times a year. You know, birthdays, anniversaries, Christmas, and the obligatory Valentine's Day. <laughs> and we think... We'll do something real special and real fancy. And, and, and we think, well, that'll hold her. <laughs> but that doesn't hold her. To her, you've done four things all year. You bum. <laughs> now, guys, you know, again, they get discouraged. Oh, for crying out. You mean, oh, I can't believe. But listen, you can make this work for you. This is great. I'm about to show you how you can succeed with a woman while doing virtually nothing. All right? I thought I'd get an applause out of that, but I guess it, I don't know. I don't like the sound of this. I, now, here's an example. You get up in the morning. Your wife's brushing her teeth. You're standing next to the bed. Make the bed. It takes 120 seconds of your life. It's nothing. She'll walk into the room and go, huh, you made the bed. Ding! You know that monument that you're building in the middle of your bedroom of old underwear? <laughs> Pick it up. Throw it in the hamper. She'll walk in. He picked up his underwear. <laughs> Ding! When you're done eating dinner, instead of just slugging off in front of the TV like Jabba the Hutt, <laughs> clear off the table. There is, it's 60, 90 seconds of your life. It's nothing. She'll go, he cleared off the table. Ding. <laughs> and, and, and now you're scoring. Ding. But see, guys don't get that. Gray uses this great analogy. He says, if you bring a woman a rose, she'll go, ah, ding. And then men, we think, wait a minute. One rose, one point? A dozen roses, 12 points. <laughs> So we run out and we spend, you know, 80, 90 bucks for a dozen long stem roses and we bring them to her. And she goes, oh, thank you. Ding. <laughs> In fact, by the raising of your hand, how many women would say, I would rather receive a single rose 12 different times than a dozen roses once? Let me see your hand. So you now a guy looks at that and goes, so inefficient (laughs) 
You want to make out like a bandit on this deal? Plan something special for your wife, like taking her out to dinner next Friday night. Nice restaurant. Go ahead and get a babysitter in advance. Get everything all set. But then tell her what you've done. A lot of guys, they'll think, oh, I'll surprise her. No, 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 you amateur. (laughs) Surprise her. Never try to surprise a woman. So, so, what, what you do is you tell her in advance. The minute you tell her, honey, guess what? Next Friday night, we're going to such. I got some nice reservations. I already got a babysitter. We're going to have a great time. The minute you tell her what you're going to do, ding! You just got a point. You haven't done it yet. All right? Then, because she's a woman, she's going to tell all the other women in her life about what you've planned. (laughs) And every time she shares with another girl, you know what Bob's got planned? He's already, next Friday night, he's got reservations at such and such, and he's already got a babysitter. It's so exciting. Every time she shares that story, ding! (laughs) You get another point. And now you are literally doing nothing (laughs) and the beauty of that system is every time you're earning a point the husband of the other wife that poor slob is losing one (laughs) so it's kind of like a double coupon thing going for you you really want to make out like a bandit engage your wife in meaningful conversation Now, to a lot of women, meaningful conversation means she talks, you shut up and listen. (laughs) But you can't just drift off into your nothing box. (laughs) You have to let her know that you're hearing her. Every time you acknowledge that you've heard her, ding! So she'll go, la, 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 la. You go, you don't say. You mean loop de doo <laughs> Ding! <laughs> la, 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 la. Really, Will? How did that make you feel? <laughs> ding, 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 ding! You're doing nothing. <laughs> now, guys, girls, sorry. <laughs> now, girls, <laughs> you can't, you can't forget that he gives himself huge bonus points for everything he does. So how can a woman earn huge bonus points with a man? (laughs) So sex is a great way to earn great bonus points with a man. But there's another way. And that is when you believe in him. Every man wants his wife to believe in him. Now that sounds like a simple thing to do, especially to you young girls who haven't been married very long. But that's because you haven't heard the incredible stupid ideas he's going to come up with yet. (laughs) And a lot of women, they they feel it's their God-given responsibility to try and keep their husbands humble or something, you know, because he'll come up with this idea and they respond, that's stupid. Oh, you're, that'll never work. You could never do that. And they don't realize when you talk to a man like that, you are doing incredible damage to him and to your relationship with him. 
Men, if you have not figured this out yet, men have very, very fragile egos. We just do. We might look like tough guys on the outside, but we're girly men on the inside because <laughs> we can't handle that kind of you know, rejection and all that kind of stuff and criticism. Most men don't handle it very well. And, and when women treat their husbands that way, when he tries to share his dreams with you and you dismiss them as stupid and ignorant and, and he can't do that, that's very, very, very damaging. Now, that's not to say you can't challenge his ideas, you know, keep him from destroying himself and the family. That's okay. <laughs> But you need, to, you need to be his number one fan. Because I'll tell you what happens. When, when you do that, you know what he learns? I cannot share my dreams with this woman. And men will stop telling their wives their dreams. If your husband never tells you his dreams, you guys might need to have a serious talk. And the reason he's not telling you is probably because you have given that kind of reactions to him. And it's very damaging to a man and now you got yourself in a really bad place because almost miraculously at work there's some bimbo there who just accidentally hears one of his ideas and goes oh you know that would be a great idea oh really oh yeah you'd be great at that oh well thank you very much (laughs) and now you're in serious trouble you need to understand something girls most affairs do not begin for sexual reasons They begin for emotional ones. And you need to let that boy know that you are his number one fan. And it's hard for a lot of women. I'll tell you who really struggles with this. Women of professional men. Uh, Doctors, lawyers, preachers' wives. A lot of them really struggle in this. Why? Because they get so tired of hearing everybody praise their husband. Oh, you're so great. He's so great. He must be wonderful. He must be wonderful. I've heard with my own ears a woman, as soon as they came into the door, she says, you know, everybody thinks you're so smart. I know what an idiot you are. What is she thinking? She's doing God's work somehow? Everybody thinks you're so great. I know how stupid you really are. Huge damage to the relationships. You need to let that boy know you are his number one fan. And as much as I love it when people come up to me after these seminars and say, oh, you were great. I loved you. And I do love that because I have an ego the size of Texas. You know, and I... And I <laughs> And the one that means the most to me is when that cute redhead comes up to me and says, you did a great job today. And I know the only reason she says that is because I just said this now. (laughs) And I don't care. All right, so be careful with the scores. Now, Now, what do you do? What do you do if the scores get so unbalanced and everything gets so out of whack? Well... Then you got to do number two. You need to learn how to keep the reset button handy. Now, when my son Philip was a little boy, I used to be a video game addict. And I loved to play video games. And I would play for hours. (laughs) And I had the latest, greatest, whatever boxes and stuff like that. And he would come up to me and say, Dad, can I play with you? Can I play too? And I'd say, sure. Sure. So I'd give him a controller. And I took the cord and ran it back, but I wouldn't plug it in. He was a little boy. He didn't know. Oh, that's terrible. What would he think about that? He's just a little boy. He's, he was thrilled. He got to have a controller in his hand. And, and we would play for hours just laughing and giggling and having a great time. But, but it did dawn on his brain at some point that something was amiss. <laughs> And he said to me one day, he says, Dad. I said, yeah. He goes, I think my, my controller's busted. I said, what makes you say that? He goes, it's not responding. Responding? He's oh. pretty impressed. He obviously had been listening to us talk, and, and I followed the I said, oh, it's not plugged in. How did that happen? So, <laughs> So we plugged it in, and all of a sudden it comes to life. He goes, yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it, that. And sure enough, the little rat could play. <laughs> and, and he's playing, and we'd have, and I'd let him get way in front, and then I'd catch up, and I'd let him get way in front, and I'd catch up. And, and we'd, we'd just do this for hours, having a great time. The, the problem with this plan was, though, is, 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 is he eventually got really good. <laughs> when I was better than him, 
I would let him get way ahead, but when he got better than me, he felt no such compassion for the old man. <laughs> and he would kill me. Just kill me. I mean, just massacre me. Just, you know, 180,000 to 12, you know. And I'd reach over and hit the reset button. Bleep! And he'd say, Dad! I'd say, shut up, keep playing. We're trying to get it. <laughs> and he'd get away and I'd do it again. Bleep! Dad, cut it out! My hand slipped. <laughs> and, 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 and I loved the reset button. Do you know why I love the reset button? Because whenever you would push the reset button, everything would go back to the way it was. Wouldn't it be great if relationships had a reset button? That when things got so crazy and the scores got so unbalanced and things were so out of whack that all you had to do was push a button and everything would go back to the way it was. Wouldn't that be great? Do you know God has given us just such a button? Some years ago, I was in Phoenix, actually, Phoenix, Arizona. And this is, you know, in the early 70s when the dinosaurs still roamed the earth. And the... Uh, <laughs> Very young man, I was part of a revival meeting. You ever been in a revival meeting? You know, they'd have meetings every night, and you never had an ending time. You just would keep going and going and going and going until people quit coming. And we, our meetings would go sometimes for months on end, as long as people kept coming and asking Christ into their lives. It was very, very cool. We had a lot of fun. During the day, we would go out, we'd hand out flyers inviting people, and at night, we'd have these meetings. Well, my favorite place to go uh, in downtown Phoenix was in front of the downtown porno shop. Because it was hilarious to hand somebody a flyer about Jesus on his way into a porno shop. Because it would just freak him out. You know, he'd go, oh, thanks. And he'd go, all of a sudden he'd go, oh, wait a minute. This isn't J.C. Penney's. What am I doing here? Uh, it was hilarious. I'd keep myself entertained for hours doing that, you know. We weren't protesting. or it was just standing. How you doing? Yeah. Hi. And it was just great entertainment. Well, the guy who owned the porno shop, though, wasn't having nearly as much fun. <laughs> and he was losing tens of thousands of dollars. And he thought we were never going to leave because there was no ending on our flyers. And we just kept going and going and going. And he became very desperate. And desperate people do desperate things. And this man hired a professional killer to come to the meeting to shoot the evangelist to get rid of us. So that after he would kill the evangelist, we would all freak out and leave town. Well, the, the perfect scenario would have been for, you know, the evangelist always came out in the beginning and, and welcomed everybody. And as things were kind of settling down, he could have just boom and in the confusion taken off. Uh, but this particular night, I'll never forget it. The evangelist calls us over and says, hey, you guys. He says, I don't feel so good. He says, something's wrong. He says, can, can you start without me? And, uh, and we said, well, yeah, sure. So, so we start without him. So, which is really kind of a drag if, if you're a killer. <laughs> Because, you know, revival meetings don't exactly go with your mojo. You know, you're, you're trying to get the nerve up to shoot somebody. Now you're stuck in a revival meeting. Well, now he's got to play along, right? He's got to fake it. So he's singing along. La, 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 And, and uh, you know, we start singing the song. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. It's good enough for me. And we're swinging it. You know, uh, all of a sudden, we stop saying, hold on a minute. We're going to sing this next verse. And this verse goes, makes me love everybody. And when we sing, makes me love everybody, I want everybody over here to come over here and hug everybody over here. And everybody over here to stand up and go hug everybody. I just want you to hug as many people as you can. So we start singing. Now this professional killer is being accosted by all kinds of people. <laughs> They're all hugging on him. Hey, man, good to see you. God bless you. Hey, praise the Lord. Man, everybody's hugging on him. He's, a, he's getting more hugged than he'd been hugged since he was a baby, I'm sure. His mama probably never hugged him. You know, and he's like, he's got to fake it, right? He's got to hug everybody. He's, uh, uh, then, then we all sat down and then people got up and started sharing testimonies. You remember testimony services? You know, people get up and talk about how God had changed their lives. And we had some pretty dramatic stories of people who were drug addicts or, you know, whatever their deal was and, and how when they asked, Christ into their lives, how God totally changed their lives around. And they got tears running down their cheeks while smiling at the same time. You know, kind of like the weather in Phoenix. And uh, <laughs> sunny yet raining, I don't understand. But, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, it, it, was, it was so powerful that he's just listening to all these people. Then finally, the evangelist comes out. And by this time, the guy is frozen. He cannot act. 
he's in a state of shock. And this evangelist starts preaching what all evangelists preach. You know, the fact that God loves us. He loved us so much, he sent Jesus to take our punishment. Jesus took what he did not deserve. So we could get what we do not deserve, which is forgiveness. And when he got to the end, he did one of these Billy Graham things where he said, if you want to ask Christ in your life, I want you to walk down to the aisle and we're going to pray for you. And about 100, 150 people stood up and came down to the front. And in the midst of this group of people came this professional killer. And when he got up there, he fell on his knees. And he started crying. He says, I can't do it. I can't do it. I just can't do it. And the counselor next to him said, sure you can. You can do it. I want you to know, God wants you to do it. And he said, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. And he pulls out the loaded weapon and hands it to him. And that's how we found out the story of how this guy came to kill somebody, but instead had his life dramatically impacted by the love of God. Now, you may not hire a professional killer. At least I hope you don't. (laughs) But the truth is, when somebody hurts us, we want them to pay. So our version of making them pay is we get bitter and unforgiving. (sighs) I'm not going to forgive you. The problem is the only one that hurts is the person who doesn't want to forgive. Unforgiveness is like taking poison, hoping the other guy will die. And to be truthful with you, I've I've never understood how so many people have a problem in this area, particularly Christians. You know, if you're not much of a churchgoer, take a nap for a minute. But but you Christians, you know, this is Christianity 101. This is as foundational as it gets. Jesus taught us basically this. If you don't forgive people, God won't forgive you. It's that simple. So I don't believe that. No, you'll get an exception because you're so cute. You're kidding yourself. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive, the, forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us as we forgive. God will not forgive you if you don't forgive people. This is non negotiable. You need to hear it. But a lot of people, they struggle with it. They will, I don't, it's so hard because you don't understand what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is an act, it is not an emotion has nothing to do with your emotions. You might feel the pain of what that person did to you till the day you die. has nothing to do with forgiveness. It's not an erasure of your memory. You might remember what that person did to you till the day that you die. And let me ask you a question. Do you think God has Alzheimer's? Do you, do you think he can't remember what you did? Do you think he looks at you and goes, something about you really ticks me off. Like, <laughs> can't remember what it was. He throws in what he calls the sea of his forgetfulness. He doesn't have Alzheimer's. He just, he, he just will never bring it up again. He'll never mention it again. That's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is this. It's when you say, I forgive you. I will never use it against you in the future. I will never speak of it again to you or to anyone else. Forgiveness has more to do with your tongue than your head or your heart. If you're still talking it through, you haven't forgiven. You need to hush. You need to let it go. That's forgiveness. All right, what would you decide? Which lady? God steps in and says, ah, forget about it. I made my decision. Oh, yeah, really, which one? He says, number five. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. God. Do you know who this is? This is Bathsheba. The only reason this woman is there is because of lust, lying, adultery, and murder. There's nothing holy about it. There's nothing righteous about it. It was never in God's plan. God never intended it. But Bathsheba becomes the mother of Solomon and the great, 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 great grandmother of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. 
You could make the argument, had it not been for lust, lying, adultery, and murder, Solomon would have never been born. You could make the argument, had it not been for lust, lying, adultery, and murder, the Lord Jesus would have never been born. Oh, well, praise the Lord that happened then. <laughs> so you're not making any sense. I know this was hard even for the writers of the Bible. If you read Matthew, the first chapter, where it says so-and-so was the father of so-and-so was the father of so-and-so, that whole, that whole list. He mentions three women by name, but when it comes to her, he doesn't even mention her name. If you read it, it'll say, the wife of Uriah. Uriah was the man David killed to get her. Wouldn't even mention her name. Why? Because it, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. How can this possibly be? How could the son of God's lineage depend on a woman who was only there because of lust, lying, adultery, and murder? I'll tell you how. Because God's love is so powerful. He can take your biggest mistake and turn it into something so beautiful it won't make sense to anybody. That is the power of the reset button. I want all the couples to stand together. If you're not here with your husband or wife, or if you're not married, you can stay seated. But if you're here with your husband or wife, I want you to stand up. And I want you to turn to each other. I thought you said we weren't going to do anything emotional. <laughs> It'll be all right. I'll even tell you what to say. All right, all the guys looking at the girls, I want you to repeat this. Well, I don't need to repeat it. Well, then just say it for the rest of us poor slobs who do. <laughs> looking at your wife, guys, I want you to say this. Honey, I'm sorry. For not always being the kind of husband I should be to you. For not giving you the attention you deserve. For being too caught up in my own world instead of our world. For demanding too much and not giving enough. For not loving you like I should. Please forgive me. With your love, your support, your patience, and your prayers, I will strive to be Girls, your turn. Looking at him, I want you to say this. Say, honey, I'm sorry for not always being the kind of wife I should be to you. For not always appreciating all that you do. For not always being the lover I know you need. For not always believing your love, your support, your patience, and your prayers, I will strive to be the kind of wife God wants me. I want you to press the reset button. The way this works is to reach over and you plant one right on her. Give her a kiss. All right, hug the girl. Hug the girl. Hug the girl. Hug the girl. Does that feel good? And then he made us cry, and I'm so confused. You can be seated. I want to thank you guys for being here with us this weekend and, and, and sharing this moment with us. And uh, we believe that uh, millions of people's lives are going to be impacted by the information that we shared this weekend as this thing is broadcast on television around the world and on DVDs and stuff like that. Uh, there's some powerful information that we've shared this weekend that a whole lot of people need to hear. Just basic, simple stuff that can transform lives. You have been wonderful. You have tolerated our making you move here, there, and the other, and, uh, and through all the sessions and stuff. You have been wonderful. I so appreciate you. God bless all of you. Thank you so much. Bye. God bless you guys.